Amen. Listen, sometimes things get messier before they get better. You know what I mean? Sometimes things get messier before they get better. I had a friend in high school who uh, one day his parents came to him and said, we are going to renovate our kitchen and our bedroom and probably the bedroom, the bathroom. They weren't quite utilizing some space over the garage. They're going to do some home renovations to kind of fix things up and kind of kind of bring their, 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 their home kind of up into the age. very simple home uh, at the time. And they said, yeah, it'll probably be like six months to uh, a year for us to do these renovations. Now, for those of you who have done home renovations before, how many of you think they completed that work in six months? Not one of you. How many of you think they completed that work within one year? Yeah, not one of you. How many of you think maybe five years? Yeah, maybe. So I so like that wasn't like the late high school. So I went and visited my friend after like when we were in the kind of the middle of college years. I was home for a little bit and we were gonna go out and meet with some friends and I was going to pick him up and he was like, Hold on, I just I was just cooking dinner. Let me just eat dinner real quick and then we'll grow out. I'm like, all right, cool, no problem. He's like, Okay, let's go down to the kitchen. I'm like, down to the kitchen. What well, as I walked by what used to be his kitchen, it was all plasticed over. Years later, mind you, we went down, we ate at his kitchen, where he had his utility sink. That was now their kitchen sink. Had his old refrigerator, had one of those stove tops, was that 1970s green. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. 1970s green. Yeah, I don't know. And he ate on a very fancy card table, and there was no end in sight. No end in sight, this poor guy. He never actually got to see the work uh, finished while he lived there. It's after they finished after he moved out from college. The point is, and it was beautiful when it was done, but the point is sometimes things get a little messy before they get better. That's true of a lot of things. And it's also, in some sense, is true of God's plan for the earth, God's redemptive plan. Because today we're going to talk a little bit about the end times, the theological word we like to use is eschatology, the study of last things, looking at the things to come. I'm going to use all those phrases interchangeably today. And when we talk about those kinds of things, I get a couple different reactions from people. Some people are like, yes, finally, let's do this. These are the people who love end times stuff. They've got their favorite end times YouTubers. They've driven their own timeline that's beautiful. It, they're really excited. They're like, yes. Then I have another group of people who are like, oh, no, not again. They're tired of it. The 20th century, they feel like we spend way too much time going over eschatology and try to answer every question. They're like, oh, no, I can't believe it. I'm not looking forward to it. And then there's a third kind of person who is... It just makes them nervous. They feel like it's complicated and they can't understand it. And they've had some bad experiences. And they're like, ugh, it's, it's too much. It's too complicated. But there's something I've found, not all the time, but more often than I'd like in all three groups when we talk about end times, last things, eschatology. That many times talking about it and researching it and thinking about it brings with it a lot of anxiety. Or sometimes even fear of the things that are to come. When I say that anxiety, even for people who love it and are into it, there's just this anxiousness as we talk about the, the Antichrist and the tribulation, and oh, it makes us I, anxious is the only way to put it. And so this morning, I think we want to reorient ourselves around what, what talking about those last things eschatology should do for us which is fill us with enormous hope about what Christ is going to accomplish. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at the hope that is in Christ when it comes to these last things, end times, the things to come. We're going to do it a little differently than we have lately. Uh, we're going to continue on in our series of Mark um, those are the last slides. You got to take those off. That's the end. That's the end of the sermon. That's the end. That's the end. That's okay. Okay. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, oh, yeah. We're going to approach it a little differently. So we're going to start off in the book of Mark. 
We're going to start off in the book of Mark, um, and I've been really uh, good at like sticking to the book of Mark, but we're going to read uh, about a conversation Jesus begins to have with disciples, and then we're going to use that as a jump off to talk about what are the things we're expecting to happen. We'll talk kind of generally about God's story so that next week we could go and actually go back to Mark chapter 13 and understand what's being done there. Because the thing is, Jesus is not going to answer the questions that we have, nor is he going to even answer the disciples' questions exactly the way the disciples asked it. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to start in Mark chapter 13. You could open up there, and then we're going to jump off and kind of see what are the things that are to Come. So, Mark chapter 13, verse 1. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. It's an interesting reply. Remember last week we were uh, in, a, in a series of stories in Mark talking about humble, uh, humble um, giving, humble servanthood, humble stewardship. And the last story of that was of a woman who they witnessed give all that she had at the offering at the temple. And so when they come out of the temple, they look around at the great buildings around them and say, look, these are amazing buildings. And they were. The temple that Herod the Great built was big and beautiful. It took in some kind of Roman uh, construction style too. A big white stones. It was gorgeous. But Jesus' answer is rather shocking. And when he says all these stones are thrown down, he means that quite literally. And Jesus is referring to three things in his response to disciples. Three things. First, that the temple will be destroyed. In 70 AD, there's a rebellion in Judah, and the Romans put it down, and they destroy the temple and burn Jerusalem to the ground, utterly destroying it. And because the temple won't burn because it's made of those big, beautiful stones, they literally push the stones off the Temple Mount because it was raised up above uh, the, the rest of the city that was down below it. And you could go there today, actually, and I saw it when I was in Jerusalem. They have kept those stones that were thrown down, that were broke through the road beneath it because uh, they were so large when the temple was destroyed. That's the first thing Jesus is referencing. But he's referencing something else. He, he's referencing the fact that after his death and resurrection, resurrection and ascension, there's going to be a change in the way God is interacting with the world. That's no longer going to be exclusively through the Israelites or now their descendants, the Jewish people, but instead he's going to be moving his plan forward with the church. Now, God has not forgotten about Israel. He's going to keep his promises to Israel, but, but the church is going to be the means in which he spreads his word and gospel throughout all the world. And so no longer will that be done at the temple. But there's a third reason, the third thing that Jesus is alluding to here. And that is, in the time that we live, in the, the age of the church after his death and resurrection, uh, that we are described as the new temple of God. Have you heard that in Ephesians? We preached Ephesians a couple years ago. That we are described as the temple of God. Because we believe that when we first trust in Jesus Christ, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. He comes to live and be present with us. And so no longer do we have to go and, and gather at some far away place where God's presence is, like the temple. No, instead we can gather wherever we are, and that is the new temple of God, that his presence is manifest in a special way, because we are the new temple of God. That's what it says in the New Testament. So like sometimes people call like the church building like the house of God. Monday morning when this room is empty, it is not the house of God. It's just the building. It's just a building. But when we are gathered here, when the church is gathered, when believers come together, it is the house of God because the presence of God is here because we are the new temple in Jesus Christ. Woo! It's a lot there, Jesus. As you could imagine, the disciples have a lot of questions. And so they ask him. Let's keep reading. Chapter 13, verse 3. 
And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, and that really means opposite the temple. If the temple's sitting here, uh, there's the Kidron Valley that kind of goes down, and then the Mount of Olives rises up above it. And it's not a huge mountain. We would call it probably a hill, maybe a little bigger than Terry Hill, but not, not huge. But it kind of looks right down on the Temple Mount. They would have been facing the front of the temple there. And while they're sitting there, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? That is really interesting phrasing. Mark knew what he was doing when he wrote those words. And those words, when are all these things are to be about to be accomplished, is the same exact wording we read in some of the Old Testament prophetic books like Daniel. And what Mark is giving a hint about is when Jesus answers this, he's not just talking about the temple. He's going to be talking about what? Eschatology. The things to come, the things that still have to happen after Jesus dies on the cross, after he is resurrected from the dead, and after he ascends to heaven. And then he starts telling them some wild things. Are you ready for some wild things? Yes. Good. Thank you, Kelly. Because <laughs> they're scary things, too. Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but is not the end yet. For nation will rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines. These are but the beginnings of the birth pains. And then let me jump ahead, verse 14, he says this, But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, then let those who are in Judah flee to the mountains. And then it says this in verse 19, For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now, And never will be. And then in verse 24, he says this, But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Whoa. There's a lot here. A lot of scary stuff here. A lot of, what do we do with that here? And so this is the point where we say, okay, let's come back and really understand what Jesus is trying to tell them, because I think it's not going to be what we first expect. And let's answer some of the questions about these things that are to come. And to answer that, let's tell the story of what God has done, is doing, and will do. And remember, whenever we talk about the future, we have to know where we came from. So let's start all the way back at the beginning, Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything that God made was good. It was good. It was good. He built this beautiful world, and then at the pinnacle of his creative power, he chose to create humans. And humans are special, because humans are said to be made in his image. They were made in the image of God, that they were to be a reflection of, of his glory. That humans were to be representatives of who God is on earth. They were, for example, to rule and reign with God over all the earth. It says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of heaven and over the livestock, over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on earth. Let us have dominion that humans were to reign over the earth with God because we were made in his image. Now that in Genesis chapter 2, the man and women are, women are living in the garden and they are to cultivate life. They are to cultivate the garden in the same way God cultivates life. Humans made in his image are to cultivate the garden, and it's this beautiful picture of God in perfect relationship with humans, humans in perfect relationship with each other, and humans in perfect relationship with their creation, which they would tend and rule over and cultivate together. But unfortunately, we know the story goes bad. 
In Genesis chapter 3, we see something called the fall. Because even God, even though God gave him the whole earth, he said, listen, there's this one tree you should not eat from. It is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you eat from it, it says, you will surely die. Well, unfortunately, Satan, the deceiver, came in the form of a serpent to the woman and said, you will not surely die. God just doesn't want you to eat from this fruit because if you do, you'll become like him. And what Satan tempts the man and the woman with is to be their own God, to reject their wonderful creator who who built all these things and who designed the man and the woman to reign with him and to cultivate with him. But the temptation to be their own God is too strong. And the woman gave in and the man gave in. And they sinned, and when they did, it broke everything. It broke the relationship between humans and God. It broke the relationship with humans and each other, which is why relationships and wars and all these terrible things happen between humans. It broke humans' relationship with creation. So it seems sometimes like all of creation is designed to kill us at times, it feels. It all broke. And and so because of their sinfulness, because they rejected God's plan, there's no way they could stay in the garden and practice evil in God's presence in the garden that he created for them. So God makes them leave the garden. In this moment of darkness, even in this moment, the darkest point in all of the history of the Bible that the Bible tells, even in that moment, There's some hope. There is. There's a little bit of hope. It says in chapter 3 when God is pronouncing a curse on the serpent. He says in verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Which is better? Is it better to have your head bruised or your heel bruised? Yeah, like if you get your heel bruised, all right, like, I don't know, it's no fun. You get your head bruised, that might be the end of me, right? If I got my head bruised, right? Like, it's not the same thing. And it's talking about Jesus, that Jesus will be bruised when he dies on the cross. But Satan will have his head bruised. He will be beaten. And then later in Genesis chapter 3, it says this, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Even as he's sending them out of the garden, he sacrifices an animal to cover them, to care for them as he sends them out. They call this the proto-evangelion in theological circles, the proto-gospel, this this hint of the hope that is to come, that God has not abandoned the human project, but he is still pursuing his people, and there's some plan and a hope for the future. And that's what happens in the rest of the Bible. We see this hope growing. We see that even though God destroys the earth and the flood, there's this promise made to Noah that he will never do that again. There's this hope for the future. He calls Abraham to him later in Genesis and says, Abraham, not only am I going to make you a great nation and give you this land, but but through your descendants, you're going to be a blessing to the whole world world and hope continues to grow he calls moses and the israelites out of egypt and says you're going to be my people i'm going to give you this law and and for you to live by it so you can be in some kind of relationship with me again even though it's imperfect that you could be in some relationship with me and show my wisdom and, and goodness to all the nations that will see you live this way and and there's more hope growing now of course humans still don't do a particularly good job with any of this Humans still, at times, they kind of follow God. At times, they struggle to follow him. And that's the rest of the story of the Old Testament. God pursuing humans and them falling short. God pursuing humans and they respond, but then they fall short again until we get to the prophets. And something changes in the prophets as we get to those books. That not only are they calling Israel to repent and come back to God, but they also begin talking about the future. That God is going to send one to fix all that is broken in the world. And Jeremiah chapter 20 says, one day they will be his people and he will be their God. 
And then John chapter 1, verse 1, says this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the Word, it says in verse 14, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory as the, as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And Jesus arrives on the scene. And everything changes with that. Jesus lives here among us on earth. God wrapped in human flesh. He dies on the cross for our sins and is resurrected from the dead. And Jesus' death is really interesting when you look back at the book of Genesis. Not only for the bruising of the heel and the, and the bruising of the head of Satan, but what did God say was going to be the result of sin? What did he say if they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and rejected his plan? That you will surely die. That the result of sin is, is death. That's how death entered into the world. And so the Savior comes who lived a perfect life. And he dies as a substitute for all of us who believe in him. That even though we have earned death through our sin, Christ has already taken that death onto himself. The one for whom no death was coming because he did not sin and died in our place. That we might be back in the right relationship with God our Father. And have the hope of eternal life through the resurrection. That is all true, but not everything's fixed yet, is it? It's still kind of a mess around here. I don't know if you looked. And we haven't been fully perfected yet either. Not all the prophecies that the prophets talked about have been fulfilled. And so we in the church are awaiting. We are awaiting Christ's return. We are waiting for him to still fix all things. We are waiting for uh, the blessed hope, the returning of our Savior. And when he does appear, it says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will ra rise first. And then we who are left we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. What he's writing here in Thessalonians is something that we call the rapture, this event, this, this appearing of Jesus that will set all these other events running that run into the end times, eschatology, the things to come. And it begins with him gathering up his church. That those who have died in Christ will be raised and those who are on earth and, and have not died that are believers in Jesus will meet him in the air. Many people ask me, Shane, what will that exactly look like? And I'll tell you, I don't know, but it's going to be amazing. It is to somehow be gathered up and meet him in the air. And the church and Jesus are never separated again. From that point on, it's a beautiful picture. The excitement of the rapture then is followed with quite a bit of difficulty. Because then enters a period of time that we believe is called the Great Tribulation. It's talked about both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. In fact, Jesus in, in Matthew, or sorry, Mark chapter 13 kind of alluded to this. I read a little bit of it to you. When he says, for in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of creation that God created until now and never will be. This time of, 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 of natural disaster and of war and of uh, uh, pestilence and of, of all sorts of issues, disease on the earth. A great time of tribulation. Now the church has been removed at this point. They are not there. But during this time, people will believe 
and Jesus will come to faith. And there's a couple reasons why God brings about this tribulation. One is to purify his people for himself, but also two, it is, it is the wrath that has been stored up for all of human evil and all of history is now being poured out onto the earth. There's several places in Scripture say this is going to last seven years, seven years of this time of difficulty. And the second half is going to be worse than the first. There's going to be people who will come and deceive. Maybe you've heard of the Antichrist or the man of lawlessness as you've read your way through the Bible. as during this time as well. But this time of great tribulation will end. And with it, Jesus will return again this time in a much more full and robust way and will conquer those armies that are opposed to God and will conquer Satan and bind Satan. It says that he will be bound for a thousand years, it says in the book of Revelation. And after he's bound for a thousand years, we'll usher in a period of a thousand year reign of Christ and his church over the earth. The way it kind of always should have been, but never could be. We call this the millennial kingdom, this thousand year or so reign of Christ over the earth. And again, a time of great hope, but it's not all fixed yet. After that thousand-year reign, we, we, we believe that Satan will be uh, unleashed one final time. He will deceive some more, and then finally, he will be beaten. He will be cast away, never to affect creation again. It says this in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Satan is removed, never to tempt again and say, you will not surely die. Never to tempt again and say, you should be your own God. Forget about the creator of the universe. He will be removed. And at that time, after the millennial kingdom, everyone else who hasn't been resurrected yet, well, guess what? They're getting resurrected too. At that point, there will be a great dividing of those different groups of people. One group, those who have not trusted in Christ, who reject God, who continue to desire to be their own God, will be separated from those who have trusted in Christ and believe in him. And they will be separated and removed, removed from God from all eternity. We call this kind of in common language, hell. Hell. And those who have trusted in Christ and believe in him instead will be ushered into a new creation, a new heaven and a new earth with resurrected bodies that do not desire to sin, do not, are not tempted away from God and will not reject him again. Revelation chapter 21 describes the new heavens and the new earth this way. It says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. We, in general terms, tend to call this heaven. A world where all the brokenness has been healed when all that was wrong has been set right. And he will wipe every tear from our eyes. And death will be no more, and sorrow will be no more, and pain will be no more. And the world will look a lot like it did back in the beginning. When God was in perfect relationship with humans, they would dwell with them in a way that we could only imagine now. That humans will be in perfect relationship with each other. Humans will be in perfect relationship with their creation. 
And they will rule and reign over that and get to know their infinite God, who we could never possibly become bored with. I know it's hard for us to imagine. But they will dwell with their inf- we will dwell with our infinite God forever in a world that is perfected. I- I'm ready for that world right now. I don't know about you. All right, right? I mean, I'm ready for that right now. But we're not there quite, quite yet. That brings us to the point of why are we sharing all this? Because we need to understand the end of the story to understand where we are in it. And so when we think of the things that are to come, eschatology, last things, whatever you want to call it, we are filled with hope, not anxiety or fear. Hope because we know how it ends. That we are the people who are, who are to live with hope by understanding that Christ is going to fix all things. We are to be a people who live with hope because we know Christ is going to fix all things. He is going to make it right. And it should change the way we live today, knowing it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. You know, Jesus used an image here. I read it really briefly in Mark, but I think it's the right illustration to understand how this affects the way we view the future. He said at one point in verse 8 of chapter 13 of Mark, he says, these are but the beginning of birth pains. I think that's an interesting image, that the image of God bringing about what he is in the future is a little bit like childbirth. Jesus uses this metaphor other places, for example, in John chapter 16, verses 21, where he talks about it this way. He says, when a woman is giving birth... She has sorrow because her hour has come. Now, as a man, it's funny for me to talk about this, but uh, from what uh, women have told me, childbirth can be extremely difficult. Childbirth can be extremely painful. And yet, people who have a child once sometimes have more children after that despite the challenges that that childbirth brings with it. And Jesus, that's the point that Jesus is making. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. I didn't quite understand this until I became, I mean, I understood it, but not the way I do now until when I became a father. And we were, I know people have different stories of, 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 of childbirth, but we were thankful enough that I got to see, the, to hold my, my son and, and see my son, and then also with my daughter, that then place my son and my daughter in my wife's arms for the first time and understood something much deeper than I ever had before, the joy of that child that was now ours. The son and this, I, I didn't even know I could love someone so much as I loved my son. And to see my wife gaze down on my son and my daughter and the love and the joy she felt at that moment. And even, even I think, a sense of peace in that moment because they had this new life with them. It was worth everything that had come before. And that is also the picture of eternity. You may face your many tribulations today before the great tribulation. You may face the different forces against God, the many antichrists, so to speak, in life today before the great antichrist. And we may look forward and see, oh boy, that was really ugly and messy before the end. But when we realize it's all going to be worth it, we don't respond with anxiety or worrying about the future or fear. We respond with hope. Hope that God is going to finally make things right. So I pray this week you would realize the hope that Jesus is going to fix all things. As you go about the world and the great things that happen and the difficult things that happen. That he's coming back. And he's going to make all things new. It might get messy before it gets better. But when it gets better, 
It's going to be amazing. Next week, as we go back to Mark chapter 13, we'll understand some important points and applications that Jesus is going to make for us in the meantime. But for this week, let's just rest in that hope that Christ is coming back and he's making all, he's going to make all things new. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we pray for a deeper understanding of the things that are to come. Some of these passages can be difficult. But Lord, let us not lose the point of what you are saying, that you are giving this hint of the future for us, that we might trust in you, that we might have hope for the future, that we might understand that you are going to make things right. I pray that you would encourage those who are hurting, who need encouragement. I need you to lift them up because they are feeling down. That you would minister them in a special way with this hope that they could cling to that know you are going to make all things good and right again. Lord, I pray for those who are facing great victories this week. Enjoy that they would, they would remember your, your, your faithfulness and, and that this is just that this week of goodness that they might experience is just a foretaste of what is to come in the end when you make all things new. Lord, I pray all of us will be changed because we understand the reality of Christ's return. We pray that he would come quickly. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.